And now, uh, so this is Andy Revkin. And I am uh, trying out something new here, which is a, uh, we'll call it sustain what? And essentially the idea is to engage in a conversation with solutions in mind around issues that matter uh, where communication innovation or the lack of it is a big part, is a problem where the impediment to progress is communication blockage, um, noise, misinformation, um, lack of engagement by people who matter. Uh, that's my job at the Columbia Journalism, <laughs> Columbia Journal, Columbia University. I've started a new initiative on communication and sustainability after 35 years of running around the world, writing about global issues related to the environment mostly and significantly related to risk always. And I got, I became, I realized that just telling the story doesn't always work. So today uh, I've got some guests coming, one of whom is here already, Jeff Delbelco, who I first got to know through um, his work at the Wilson Center um, and uh, the initiative there on the environment and security and on a blog that had I guess my second favorite blog name, uh, dot earth was my, would be my first because I created in, in 2007. And, but the new security beat, the new security beat really nailed this question that we're exploring today, which is uh, how do we define security? What are the, the old model was essentially uh, external power, um, surveying the world and being very strong and prepared to inter intervene and, and building alliances and the like. And I think the virus that has emerged since November from when it was uh, some mi one micron sized viral particle moved from a bat to a pangolin to a person. Uh, we don't quite know all those details yet, but it was definitely in November. And uh, it's a novel virus that human beings, human bodies haven't experienced. So it's finding its way around the world through our globalized systems of trade and commerce and, and transportation and in, in a way that the speed is just astounding. And now, now we're seeing the impacts reverberate. And this is just chapter one. Um, the public health officials I talked to, of course, and epidemiologists and uh, folks have been trying to develop vaccines uh, and just protocols against uh, to, to prevent pandemics are just um, new. It wasn't like this was out of the blue to, to them at all. So, so Jeff, um, before I start exploring Twitter and the like, could you just, uh, you know, give a quick snapshot of your background as it relates to this kind of issue? Uh, sure thing, Andy. Uh, thanks so much. So I come at these um, broader considerations under a security umbrella from the environmental side, as you uh, indicated. Um, now in the last, say, 10, 12 years, that's been heavily focused on climate change, but uh, has really been uh, a discussion for how we need to understand a wider set of issues uh, posing the, the threats and the opportunities under the security umbrella since really the end of the Cold War. They're not new issues. They didn't start with the end of the Cold War. They were there before, but there, was, there were cracks and openings for that wider discussion. Um, and whether it be health or poverty or environment or population, these are issues that um, have been there have gotten some increased attention in that security discussion. Um, but as our current crisis uh, indicates, there can be lots of uh, worthwhile analysis suggesting these issues are critically important, um, yet the early warning doesn't always translate into early action or even uh, on time action in, in responding to them. Yeah, and uh, I have this book here, uh, when the long emergency mm -hmm. was um, uh, James Kunstler, the uh, son of Howard Kunstler, uh, the son of the more famous Kunstler, wrote mm -hmm. this book about 2004. And the long emergency, th this has some sections that are relevant. Um, some sections are out of date, but that concept of a long emergency, meaning these these phenomena that um, there seem to be two two types and they're interrelated. It's the uh, on dot earth they used to call them slow drips. And, mm -hmm. and and hard knocks, and and of mm -hmm. course slow drips lead to hard knocks, and here you have again 
And, and I don't know if you could just talk a little bit about this this current evolving situation in the sense of already we know it's a trillion dollar well the market the market impact already was multi trillions um, and yet it didn't come through the normal it what didn't follow in, uh, pathways that we historically track really closely war mm -hmm. terrorist attack 911 911 had its own slow drip hard knock aspect um, you know there was a lot yeah. of intelligence leading up to it and it was a failure of agencies to communicate that caused the missed uh, opportunity to yeah. maybe snuff it out um so i is do you see there's a, is there any traction toward adjusting how we look at issues risks like this so that we can be better at it or are we just still stuck well i i certainly uh could make a case for how we are taking the broad set of uh health environment poverty issues more seriously with a wider set of actors with with budgets that until here, at least in the United States, until recently had a upward slope in terms of funding. Um, however, I think that if we step back an additional step, it's as human beings and as we organize ourselves, we are, um, we really prefer to be reactive as opposed to proactive, uh, react rather than prevent. And um, we are really focused on what the immediate issues of the day, the threats that are right in our faces, literally and figuratively. And so in that sense, we make some really um, short attention spans to understand that the incremental, the drips can uh, turn into hard knocks. The incremental um, is not uh, kind of a slow, gradual curve that there have these, these uh, times where uh, suddenly it wouldn't vary quick order can break out and create huge problems, whether those are a historic fire season in Australia and how, how right. much that displaces and, um, or the, this kind of pandemic. And, and further, we not only do we not pay sufficient attention, but at times in the name of uh, other priorities, we undercut the basic day-to-day -day foundations uh, that monitor and even pay attention to tell us when um, there are these extreme situations and, and the outbreaks. And so the, the fact that we're cutting budgets for um, these issues is just, it's a, it's a head scratcher, but we're just not very good at being proactive and preventative. We want to react, which is often, as is the case here, so much more expensive and so much more costly in, in lives <laughs> in the treasure. I, I I know I I uh, maybe I'll show it. Well, I think I see Alice Hill showing up there. And uh, Alice, could you just speak a little bit so I can hear your voice? Sure. Hi. Yeah, you're there. Great, great. And I Hi. think uh, Rod is trying to come in, but something's. Let me uh, disengage him, and then I'll try to re-engage him in a second. Um, it's wonderful on a Sunday afternoon to be able to talk with, you know, luminaries who are really so deeply dug in on this these questions. Uh, hold on, I just wanted to show something relevant to what I was talking with Jeff about. So on my blog, um, I wrote about six different pieces with this phrase, are we stuck with blah, 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 bang. And that, <laughs> it, it, it had initially been posted back in 2008 by a German commenter on the blog who went under a quirky uh, name, um, I can't remember. And and it just keeps coming up, you know. And I keep thinking, okay, we have we have we have flu trends, and you know, we have AI, we have um, global observation capacity that's unparalleled. It's unimaginable how visible everything is now compared to ten or fifteen years ago. Even there are satellites monitoring how much coal is in the piles outside of Chinese coal plants, and which ones are getting completed and which ones are not complete. And China can't uh, just sort of fudge its numbers anymore because the, 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 so many things can be kind of ground truth. And here with this virus, you know, many aspects of it were being tracked well. China definitely had an information. Uh, they they were muzzling people who were trying to make the point that the scientist, as you know, who, who was lionized after his death, uh, I just had Lori Garrett um, in a YouTube in conversation the other day, a great uh, pandemic reporter, and she said there were people in China shouting the name of the deceased doctor out their windows. 
uh, mm -hmm. on video that was being plucked out off the Chinese social media as quickly as it was being put on. So that, you know, information isn't always flowing as it should. But here we are. Um, I, I'm going to check in with Rod in a minute to see if I can get him his connection to work. But Alice Hill, um, here you are with Jeff DeBelco now from Ohio University. Alice is um, at the Council on Foreign Relations now, right? Yes, I am. But with a long career from the courts to uh, serving on the National Security Council under the Obama administration, focused a lot on disaster risk reduction and climate. Um, we'll talk about climate a little bit. Uh, I'm sure as we get into this, but Alice, you know, when you wake up each day and you look at how this is playing out and you know that the public health and epidemiology folks have known this is coming and have a very, have a deep clarity about what needs to be done. And yet you still see here in New York earlier today, I did a cast on this, this platform with a uh, Jeremy Zalar uh, who uh, went to a website where you can track the occupancy of restaurants in real time. And they were all way over this limit that the mayor had set. Uh, mm. And, but that's everywhere, you know, and then you look at what happened with the uh, administration's uh, transportation, Homeland Security decisions that caused these. Her what, Alice, what did you think when you saw these social media and video around what was happening in these, these airports last night, if, if you were online, you know, with this unbelievable overload of people? Well, uh, this has been very chaotic. Uh, you know, I have had a peripatetic career. I was a judge before I joined the Department of Homeland Security. But when I was at the Department of Homeland Security, I was responsible for preparations for biological threats, which included a pandemic. Mm. So I worked on the pandemic plans for the department. Uh, I headed the working group for biological threats. Uh, and then when I was in the White House, I was senior director for resilience policy. And that included, uh, I oversaw the work of several doctors who were initially working on pandemic and other preparedness issues. And then uh, once Zika and Ebola uh, evolved, they were pulled into that work. I also very much supported uh, when they removed that um, area from my directorate to put it into the Global Health Directorate at the National Security Council. So we would have this deep focus on preparing for threats that you know, of infectious disease. It could be also an aerosolized anthrax attack, but they can quickly bring the nation to its knees. And we need standing uh, playbooks, and then we need to exercise those scenarios, and then we need to develop, uh, follow those scenarios if they still fit, but we need to prepare all the time. And what we're seeing is that the Trump administration has downplayed this threat from the get-go. And I think they did simply didn't appreciate how a pandemic spreads uh, and that it can be devastating to the econ economy, to all, obviously public health, but the ramifications spread uh, so far. And we are just beginning to understand that as we see this unfold in real time. It seems, uh, well, Greg, I, I mean, Jeff, do you wanna, um... What's your sense of the politics here uh, and the, the disconnect between some of these responses and mm -hmm. what, again, has seemed so clear in the uh, both in the science and just the history of uh, epidemics? Yeah, well, we've seen time and time again that expertise matters and having expertise in place, as Alice says, and then listening to it. And so you start by not cutting your pandemic office uh, and officers out of the administration. Uh, in favor of a, a, a traditional um, national security, uh, narrowly focused definition of security. And then even when you do have the issue arising, you take advantage of the time that we had when it was focused in China to prepare and mm -hmm. do things that one would hope would be fairly straightforward, like prepare tests and learn from other countries and how they're experiencing it and see the success of, for example, the South Koreans that did a massive amount of testing and were able to understand uh, patterns and, and take steps that have, have flattened the, the, the curve for them. I think it is the, the, the real, there are a lot of downsides to viewing these kinds of threats through a political lens, a uh, an election year lens, and we are seeing the kind of ignoring and muzzling of expertise 
that would suggest that we act much faster than we have. Uh, and uh, because that information might actually recognize it as the crisis that it is. And so here, I think the, the political lens to the exclusion of, frankly, the national interest uh, has really done a, a disservice. And there are going to be a lot of people hurt and a lot of businesses hurt, uh, a lot of lives disrupted uh, as a result. And yet, uh, the latest polls I saw showed uh, just yesterday that um, the Republicans support uh, the Trump's, the Trump administration's handling of the coronavirus, uh, 80%. It's like 80%. Uh, the national average is about 40%. I think Democrats are 10. Uh, so, so uh, you know. Uh, well, this will, this will test that support in a couple of weeks yeah. when, yes. uh, when older generations. Um, I know. Fortunately, are are not going to be uh, uh, immune to this by their politics, and so um, yeah. it's it's going to be horrible. That um, and certainly nothing anybody wishes for. Uh, but I fear mm -hmm. that 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 the political lens will seem quaint uh, shortly when when we start experiencing the real um, uh, the impacts that are just they're known, right? Uh, I mean, there's lots mm -hmm. that we don't know, but we know from historical experiences that these can be devastating on a scale that are hard to imagine until they actually happen. And so our, our inability to learn from history and to listen to our experts who have studied it and, and dealt with analogous situations, um, that, uh, and, and frankly also to, to uh, take seriously expertise and experience from outside the United States and understand that there are a lot of smart folks who have had experiences that we really should be learning from and, and, and approach this with humility and modesty uh, as we as we tackle these issues. Uh, I know, a Alice, um, there, the issues with the testing alone are just astounding. Um, I think it was it was over a week ago when I noted the Korean example and they had they were up to testing at that point, I think 10,000 people a week, which now they're doing way more than that, but we were, and there was some reports comparing that to the United States having only done at that point four or five thousand total. And I did note that you know when you do it on a per capita basis, three hundred twenty million Americans versus fifty million Koreans, it's mind blowing. So, and some of that has to predate this administration. I, I what is there? I want to be sure. Yeah, understanding path dependency and how agencies work or don't work. And it's not like the Trump administration literally came in and I mean, they did all, you, maybe you could enumerate some of the things you know that were done, but then also let's talk candidly about the, are there still some group basic structural questions here that, that are problematic? This, just as Jeff and I were talking a minute ago about 9-11, you know, when it was the failure of intelligence agencies to talk to each other here, um, are there structural issues beyond just the wrecking ball that was there for the last three or four years? Yes. Uh, what has happened uh, in the last 10 to 15 years, or uh, we, we have starved public health in the United States. And it's not just public health at the federal level, but at the state and local level. And of course, this is a problem similar to uh, ad adaptation to climate change. These efforts primarily happen in cities and subnational governments, uh, states, local communities. And if there's no money to invest, it's not invested. So we've stretched the public health system uh, very thin. We do not have the kind of diagnostic testing we would hope to have. We haven't funded the kind of basic research to help the nation be prepared. We've uh, not done as much on vaccines as we should have. This was all known, and this was true in the Obama administration. And so to lay the blame of all of this on the Trump administration would not be fair. It's just very difficult to get people to focus on the issue when there's not a crisis at hand. As Jeff has said, these are uh, viewed as remote risks and then not worthy of attention. So there have been stacks and stacks of reports. Uh, the Blue Ribbon Commission on Biodefense, I believe called now the Bipartisan Commission. I wrote an editorial two years ago about the need for uh, pandemic preparedness on the uh, 99th anniversary of the Spanish flu. But there's just not a lot of political will for this. It is frankly more attention getting to do a, a wall than when we're 
right. to play to the immigration concerns. Right. Uh, there's a question from Jeremy Zalar, who was on with us earlier today. Uh, he he had been in the Obama administration, helping to make sure websites, all the, the digital.gov works. Um, and he asks here, Alice, uh, based on your experience, what data do the people on front lines need the most this week? And, uh, and there was another comment here from Mario Seabach. What can be done now? I, I guess we maybe we'll back off from the systemic analysis that I've been focusing on toward right now, today, what are the things that we could do uh, that could help people prepare or respond better? Well, there's a need for those who are truly on the front lines, the, the health care providers. But for all of us, and, and this was true in the Obama administration, we spent a lot of time thinking about what the messaging would be. We need trusted messaging. This is not a political moment. This is about public health. It's about life and death. And so we need to directly address the people with a message of what does social distancing mean? Does it mean 10 people in a room? I've seen 10 to 500. That is not going to right. leave the nation prepared unless we understand what is the best practice. That is exactly the role the federal government should be playing here. They should provide information to state and local governments. It is ultimately up to those governments to decide what to do, but we need to make clear what works and what will keep the nation safe to get that curve down so that we can continue to provide health care consistently and that those who need chemotherapy will get chemotherapy in the midst of this pandemic. Yeah, and, and so many other things too. Um, you know, all the other diabetes, all the treatments now that we're just handling patients, uh, the, 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 the logistics in our health system, even before you get to the hospital beds, are, yes. are just nightmarish. My father, who's 92, right now today is in an emergency room uh, in a hospital in New Haven. And, uh, you know, it's all cordoned off and I can't go, you know, there's no way I would ever go to uh -huh. see him. But, uh, and he's in a, a facility, a nursing facility that's in lockdown. And, and it's, it feels like the challenge, the now challenge is enormous already, even, and if we're just at the beginning. I agree. I mean, I, you see, might see I have this uh, harness around me. I just had rotator cuff surgery. And one of the things to have a successful outcome is you have to have consistent physical therapy for six months. Oh, I don't know if I'll be able to have physical therapy for six months. So am I going to have a bum arm? Minor in comparison to everything else, but very real. How am I going to continue to get health care during that's not life threatening health care uh, or to help me uh, live? But it's real. Uh, we yeah. may have a very difficult period here that will have consequences long term for some. Yeah. yeah. We'll definitely have consequences, economic and otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I think in terms of the the kind of the question in terms of what data do folks on the front lines need, I think part of the challenge uh, that in some respects uh, we're getting some messaging. Uh, I know at the state level here in Ohio, uh, Governor DeWine has been having daily briefings and he brings people together, but then puts the experts up front to have to provide that communication. And we're getting some of that uh, now from the, the federal level. But I fear that we're really paying the price of a consistent uh, kind of attack on expertise, attack yeah. on science. Um, uh, undercutting the trust in the media in terms of communicating and that everybody is uh, supposed to be on a side from, from the journalism and you know, journalism and what is called journalism has changed dramatically given access yeah. that we all have. Um, but I think uh, as we saw pictures of bars and restaurants filled uh, all across the country last night, uh, and a few taking to Twitter to say, you know, it's my right to do what I want. Um, yeah. We've got a you know, kind of a combination of lack of collective responsibility and a failure to really appreciate the threat that we're facing uh, means that a large segment, and it doesn't take that many, but a large segment are taking this still uh, very lightly. And they are big changes and it's very sudden. Uh, and if we just think of what we were doing a week ago or two weeks ago, yeah. Uh, but I think we're paying a price for for low levels of scientific literacy, low levels of trust in science, 
uh, suspicion of, of expertise, which morphs into elites, which were supposed to be uh, vilified because they're um, purely self-interested. And so um, it, it's time for us to, to understand that those are the people who in these circumstances really are the difference makers in terms of uh, how, what the outcomes of this crisis are. That brings to mind a couple of things. Um, one is that uh, yesterday, or was it well, March 14th? Is that yesterday? <laughs> I can't remember. Yeah. Uh, I had a dis an hour long discussion with Payman Naimi, a journalist in Iran, and with um, Laurie Garrett, as you can see here. Mm -hmm. And one of the points that came up that Laurie actually brought up was really interesting. It was um, that Iran has just been epically disrupted. You know, it's one after the other, everything from earthquakes to uh, this just this this illness to um, the uh, economic uh, uh, stranglehold, etc. And uh, so the people there are attuned to um, responding to communitarian aspects. You know, whatever the government is up to, there is some capacity for people to pull together. Um, and we went through some other examples of countries around the world where uh, they've ha had a history, at least in recent times. We did have 9/11. But other than that, you, you you really and that you know it was epic. Uh, I was reporting on it in so many ways. It was disruptive and monumental. It left its own impact on the political landscape and everything else for us for a long time. Um, but hardship for the average person, hardship, changing your lifestyle for the sake of others, uh, you know the uh, everything that happened during World War II to you know not eating butter and and uh, conserving metals and stuff we haven't really had a moment like that so are we just out of shape well i think we're out of shape but i think we're also having poor information shared oh yeah um, i was going that's was another point i was going to bring up about, uh, i saw representative devin nunez <laughs> from uh california urging people to go to their local pub right we need to have consistent messages do not do that because you may not be at risk but grandma the nurse uh who treats uh grandma and the immune suppressed neighbor are at great risk but we're not getting that yet so yeah. it's hard for even people to understand what sacrifices they're supposed to be making we are just receiving too many mixed signals uh, and uh, I have to say, I think that is the responsibility of the federal government to be very clear about what should be done to achieve the goal that we need, which is to make sure that the least number are infected at this time so that we can right. spread this disease, the course of the disease. Mm -hmm. And that's where I, I, it just came across here re recently where we are seeing leadership at state and local levels. So I think uh, Governor DeWine here in Ohio has announced that as of 9 p.m. this evening, restaurants and bars in Ohio are going to be closed. And so it's not, it's not going to be left up to, to people and Devin Nunez uh, who, who, yeah, in inexplicable uh, advice in the face of this crisis. No, it's incredible. And, and you know, we... Maybe we'll talk a little bit about how this resonates with so many other issues, climate. Um, Rod Schoonover, who was trying to join us from North Carolina via the web, he seems to be continuing to have trouble, but he did send this message. Unfortunately, both the public and federal government have been primed for a terribly inadequate response, You know, which is kind of what we're saying. And the, the one thing, the point I wanted to bring up, secondary to what I said about the conversation I had with Lori um, yesterday and the Iranian journalist, um, Payman, we also talked about budgets for communication that um, it's extraordinary. Uh, Lori did a piece for the uh, the Lancet, a commentary for the Lancet that I cited yesterday. And it's scandalous how small the budget is for communication at the World Health Organization and organizations like it too. And it's not just putting out press releases or the latest numbers on the disease. That's that's being done well, but it's um, it's uh, being on social media. Uh, th there's this expectation that Facebook and Twitter have, can have search engines and uh, AI quick enough to tamp down disinformation. Um, it's not possible. And, but, and it doesn't have the, they don't have the expertise. They don't have the judgment. 
And that's where the WHO, I, I, I have to check with WHO, but Lori said they have one person worldwide who is managing their social media. And, and you know, one thing, I've, the reason I'm working at Columbia now is I'm building, uh, the, I'm trying to ex express to the world that they're, the new information environment we live in, we live in, it's a fundamentally new feature of the earth system. It's like a new part of the earth. It, it's able to transmit things faster than this virus moved for good or ill. You know, you can have global uh, organization around Fridays for Future, global activism among kids coordinated around the planet. It started with 350 and now it's, you know, it's more even more effective. But you can also have, you know, you have a terrorist network that can communicate globally as Al Qaeda did ahead of, uh, you know, and, and ISIS in recruiting disaffected London kids to become terrorists. and. If we're not engaged in that system, exploring it in aggressive ways, uh, understanding how its dynamics, not just putting out press releases, uh, but actually being listening, uh, then we're, we're in deep trouble. And if these agencies don't have the investment in communication capacity, sort of the communication intelligence, it feels like a real lapse. And I'm not sure who pays that bill, but you know, we're paying the bill in other ways. I, I do think um, sitting now for the last eight years in a in a university, I think too there are additional responsibilities than the international organizations and the government. Um, I, I think that for a very long time and still today, the definition of success in the academy and getting ahead as a scientist is producing peer-reviewed research, right. uh, and st but stopping there and seeing any sort of other engagement and communication. Uh, with audiences outside the academy as an opportunity cost that, that are a zero-sum game. So that was time not spent producing more peer-reviewed science. And I don't think that um, such as issues like today's, we have the luxury for having everyone in the academy doing that. Some, some folks, that's just what they should be doing. Uh, but we need to find ways to have rewards and not simply penalties for those who can help uh, communicate and help uh, both senior decision makers and the wider public, variety of constituencies to understand the best that science can tell us and continue that as a two-way conversation rather than a one-way street that uh, will um, allow us to at least practice adaptive management and making the best decisions you can with the with the best understanding you have, but then being open to new science and new information that allows you to make a perhaps different decision going forward. And so those those of us in the academy who are interested in applied work and and having a foot in both of those worlds, I think it's incumbent on us to try to expand um, the opportunities for that to happen for people based in universities and research institutes and and the funding and the support that and, and kind of professional advancement is is critical to making progress on this as well. So Alice, uh, yeah, Rod, Rod posted a comment, which I'm not sure you could see. It says, Alice's point about chaotic messaging is very important. The White House needs to partially atone for their mistakes from the last week to get people to take social distancing seriously. Um, so just uh, maybe, Alice, you could comment on that, that general question uh, as it relates to what George uh, Jeff was saying, too. You know, universities can do way more. Uh, absolutely. It, again, one reason I'm doing trying to do what I'm doing. But what sure. is it the government? You've made this point already, but it's worth making it again. Well, I think that communication, as Jeff and you have said, is absolutely right. I think Jeff's observation is one of the weak links in our ability to prepare as a nation for catastrophic risks. Uh, as you, I recently completed a co-authored book on climate change, which is similar to this challenge in that it's interdisciplinary challenge. It calls on all, it will affect all systems that we know and has uh, deep consequences. One of the things that my co-author, Leo Martinez Diaz and I concluded is that uh, first of all, as Jeff has alluded, we've got in our universities, um, people working in silos, doing peer-reviewed research, but often it can't break out of the silos so it doesn't spread and it doesn't enter into the policy world unless someone happens upon it or there is some other mechanism to have it enter. And then you have a lack, so you need silo breakers, uh, academics, 
who are willing to cross and, and be a public voice. And so we need universities that will support that. Our tenure system does not assist in this effort. Uh, then we also need translators. We've got scientists who are producing great science, but that science also remains siloed and within that community. And we need people who can translate the science uh, into terms that lay people can understand. And to your point, uh, finally, uh, Andy, is, is we need to have communicators, skilled communicators who can do all these things, take the interdisciplinary research and what we learned from the scientists to make it real. Uh, and then in the absence of that, I think we are delayed in our ability to be prepared because simply we can't get it into a form that can, it can be applied. I saw this firsthand at the White House. I saw this firsthand at DHS. If there weren't, if there wasn't a translator and a communicator in the room for the policymakers, it probably wasn't going to get considered. Yeah, um, my brother actually just posted a comment. Um, he's a doctor. Um, he works for Pfizer now, but he's a physician affiliated with Yale also, and he had to be tested this past week or so because of a viral illness he got in um, coming back from Europe. <laughs> Luckily, he just tested yesterday negative, but here's the, the process was interminable. He tried starting, I think, over a week ago. It took him until Tuesday to actually get the test. And you can see here on the screen, the um, he took this picture. It's a drive-in, the drive-in uh, testing place at Greenwich Hospital. Mm. Uh, and uh, he got the result back yesterday. Negative. So just think of that. Here's a high priority person. He still does rounds at Yale. So he's a doctor. You know, he, it took him a week, more than a week, ultimately, to get a negative result. And, you know, and, and what he's saying here is isn't part of the problem a uh, structural issue related to federal government not being empowered to control local health care policy? You know, are we too fragmented for some of this to be coordinated and done in that way you would want? Is there, are there some weaknesses in our, the way we? You know, you could say our strengths are our, are our weaknesses. That we're never going to be China. We wouldn't want to be China. But what is what is missing there in terms of federal versus the mosaic of states? Well, this this reveals uh, our you know the way we're established is uh, under our constitution. Uh, unless it's an enumerated power to the federal government, it remains in state and local hands. And that's uh, longstanding, but it will reveal that uh, autocratic societies, and I think we're seeing that already with results in Singapore and to some extent China, have uh, can be more nimble than we can be because we have a very decentralized form of government, which goes also to our public health system. That remains an enormous challenge, but I think the federal government has a role that it has not played, which is to be the source of best practices, bring together people regularly, public health systems across the country to train, developing sample model playbooks, really being the go-to uh, entity for answers on this issue. Right now, what we see is we're leaving each state, each city, each whatever, to reinvent the wheel. And they come up with a patchwork right. of policies that are inconsistent. And they, of course, we know this virus, like climate change, does not honor our human made jurisdictional boundaries. So to expect that you have, you can't congregate in Ohio, you can't have restaurants open in Ohio, an adjoining state may have a lot of restaurants open and those people are going to drive to an adjoining state and come back and um, infect the people, infect the people in Ohio. So we need strong guidance from the federal government uh, as to what, what the policy should be. And uh, I want to bring in a couple of questions or comments here that are relevant. One is, um, well, here's Rod again. Uh, who says one part of the na the national security argument that I'm not hearing much is uh, we are likely to have many ur urban centers, including Washington, D.C., overwhelmed in the next 10 to 14 days. This makes the U.S. especially prone for other risks. This question of other risks is something that uh, obviously we've all been thinking about. Anyone, you know, we live in a multiple hazard landscape, right? Uh, there could be an earthquake tomorrow in L.A. There could be, uh, well, we're not in the hurricane season quite yet, even with global warming. Uh, but there could be a terrible flooding event, and uh, these compounding risks are just uh, scary to think about. And even on the global scale, you know, 
getting back to the blah, 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 bang, underinvestment in these big risks that get discounted hyperbolically. You know, I'll, I'll just bring up even something that was in my last book, the uh, Carrington event in the 18, 1859, I think, when, when there was a solar flare that um, took mm -hmm. out, what, if it had occurred today, it was a multi-trillion dollar instant hit to uh, everything because of the impact on microelectronics. And, you know, I'm not saying a solar flare is going to happen tomorrow, but take if, as Rod says, if, you know, it's a really scary moment. Uh, and I don't even think, do you have a sense that we're remotely prepped for that? I don't <laughs> and I'll tell you, I think you can imagine, I mean, one thing that is occurring is this is happening to across, across the globe. So governments everywhere are struggling. But uh, certainly with climate change, you can imagine that if the United States were particularly hard hit with a number of events, it would be a good time for mischief uh, right. in terms of uh, terrorist attack or otherwise. And right. to the extent that uh, the terrorists are healthy, yes, uh, we could have uh, we, we will be we are weakened right now. Uh, because the disease is spreading and people may not be able to report to work as we assumed they would. Uh, and that would include, it could include at some time, civilian workforce as well as our military workforce. So, um, yes, it's absolutely right. Uh, this, and so our delay and our lack of prepare, preparation uh, and our confusion right now are undermining our national security. Um, that brings up the broadest question which is, is it time, is it past time to redefine national security? I, I've spoken about this and written about it on my blog. Uh, you know, if you look at the federal defense budget and you think about that as our current, well, you could take intelligence and defense and, and diplomacy. That's a trillion dollars, right? Maybe, maybe more, add that all up. 1.2 trillion. Um, and then you think about how much of that is spent internally bolstering our internal resilience and capacities and how much of it is sort of projected. This gets to this question, not just the communication capacity, but are we just fundamentally under, under undervaluing the internal part of security? Um, this was that wonderful Mr. Y report that Mick Mickleby and um, uh, Wayne Porter did in 2011 for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, which at the time I, I said it was like the most important sustainability document I've seen. And it was essentially making this case that we have to reframe how you define risk and, and the sources of it. And then you have to shape investment and intention around that. And if this doesn't serve as a good wake up call, I don't know what does. Um, what's your sense of that? Is there is there a possible moment here or is that wishful thinking? Or is that even appropriate? Yeah, well, Alice will have a, a, a really important view from somebody who's been at the senior most levels of government. I think as somebody who's studied the evolution of how, it, especially in the United States, security has been defined, um, I think in many respects, we are um, well on our way, if not um, in many quarters, having redefined security and key actors like the National Security Council or the National Intelligence Council, where, where Rod worked and, and led assessment of these issues, they have a much broader agenda of issues they're paying attention to. What we haven't done is realign budgets and authorities to actually um, put the resources against those, um, those threats in ways that um, understand that a the traditional tools of security, uh, the military are remain critically important, um, but so many of these issues are not solved with those tools. Those are mismatched tools. There are a lot of uh, excellent uh, approaches, the scenarios and the gamings and, and the planning uh, uh, is something I hope we use more and more from that traditional security world. Uh, but we're really not putting the budget to these other issues, even as we've identified them consistently back to literally the Reagan administration and Bush 41 through Clinton, through Republican and Democrat alike. These issues were in the key documents, uh, but doesn't mean that we're budgeting and allocating resources that way. 
It's so interesting. Well, Alice, what do you think about that? Oh, I agree. And I would add that, um, you know, we've historically thought of national security as military boots on the ground and being able to fight off some foreign foe. But at the end of this coronavirus, it'll be clear if it hasn't before, but our national security depends on public health and it also depends on our economic security. So we need to be thinking much more broadly, as your question alludes to, uh, to how to make sure that happens. There's another challenge here is that we tend to fund after the fact. We know that if we spend a dollar today to mitigate future risk, in general, we'll save at least $6. But what have we done here? We shrunk our budgets on uh, for pandemic work. We shrunk the budget for the CDC. The current proposal is very low. And now we have a proposal for a $50 billion bailout. That $50 billion is the same budget we're requesting for the whole Department of Homeland Security, which is the third largest department in the United States. This is just not the way to go forward. We need to be able to dedicate money on an ongoing, appropriate in advance money to make sure the nation's prepared. Otherwise, we just get caught with our pants down and then we have terrible outcomes. So if anything, if we can learn that we need to invest in mitigation of a risk in advance, uh, we can keep us all a lot safer. And of course, that means militarily, which we do already, but it means a lot more investment in traditional homeland security. Right. So, uh, Rod, Rod has another comment posted here. Um, whoops. Oh, sorry. Here you go. He says, we are living a, a national security doctrine inherited from the 20th century, especially from the resource and personnel perspective. Um, that brings up this issue of path dependency, though. Uh, and there's a guy, Patrick Keyes. I'm just showing his um, a tweet related to his work, uh, who I found, he did a paper last year on what he calls Anthropocene risk. And essentially, it describes the importance of looking at any turmoil on the ground today in the context of these longer pathways, including what you were just saying about spending norms and agency structures. Um, you know, if you're looking at uh, in Middle East disruption and climate, you, you have to look at water policy and the like. And it all lays out the importance of somehow breaking narratives. Uh, and unfortunately, in our government, in our the way Congress works, um, the way spending works, it's not just the narratives that need to be broken. It's everything. The funding process is so yes. built in, so structural. So, and I don't think even this event we're seeing now can break that. I I, I don't know. Are, are we stuck with some of those norms, or or, or not? Well, I think uh, Rahm Emanuel had uh, put it well, uh, never let a good crisis go to waste. This is uh, the opportunity for the federal government to actually look at risk mitigation in a whole new, uh, or develop a whole new paradigm. And one thing that we know is that as difficult as it is, as Jeff pointed out, for change to be made in the absence of a crisis, uh, we know that whole countries can move in the face of a crisis. We saw it. In fact, the reason, one of the reasons the Dutch are so prepared for water uh, coming uh, into their country is they had a terrible flood in 1953. And they still commemorate that flood every year. School kids learn about it. And right. it, it just is part of their culture. So now they're the best water engineers in the world. They understand a lot more about living with water than pretty much any other country. And so they've emerged as world leaders. If we could take this terrible event here now and learn from it and use that to better prepare and, and change our budgeting system so that we have a common sense approach that would be one that we would hope we would all use with our own families, we'd be a lot better off. And that will take, though, some political leadership and political will. This event gives the opportunity, however, to build that political will. That's what's so uh, remarkable about it. It will be lots of tragedy. This is not to downplay it, but no. we can only hope that some good will come out of this. This presumes we can hold an election. 
Actually, I'm writing an article on that right now. A yeah. Very good question. And there have been, physical, sorry. Uh, the physical impediments to holding an election, yes. Now I've seen some calls for you know, really, in an emergency way, coming up with different ways to, to vote. That, uh, yes. I look forward we to seeing to your story. need to think out of the box here, yes. And think Same ahead. Again, this is yeah. this is right. This is moments away. And, and yeah. um, I did post this um, tweet. I did show this tweet I posted a few days back. Well, oh, I was really glad to see the Times opening up its, um, you know, paywall. Um, and this is an epic moment where everyone has to, in some way or other, open up their paywall. Oh, I just saw Rob. There he is. There he is. Hi. Hi. You're coming in to save the save the day here at the end, Rob, because we're Rod, I mean, because we're kind of like all we're worried we could even get an election done. But my what I said in this note was uh, let's hope this story this story ends up being about a country pulling together after two decades of pulling itself apart and about a thorough reimagining of what we mean when we say national security, making it far more about inner strength and inclusive resilience. Uh, so Rod, uh, you know, we Hi. you posted Hi. some great comments. But if Thank you have you. some thoughts here over the next few minutes, so but what do you think when you you're looking at this this tsunami, this kind of microbial tsunami that's happening? Well, as I mentioned uh, in a prior uh, posting, I, I think it it's something that we need to really think about is that you know although the federal government has really dropped the ball um, on this response, um, the public has also been primed to. Uh, not believe experts, um, to pay attention to only uh, one media, uh, one preferred media outlet. Uh, and I would say that I'm, <laughs> I am really horrified by seeing images on, on Twitter of people just brazenly, yeah. uh, you know, ignoring uh, the warnings about social distancing. I, I, it's, I, I, it's, a, it's one of those feelings that um, it feels like these moments will be captured in a museum in the future to really understand why things went so awry um, in the United States. And, you know, on our <laughs> way, so my, my wife and my daughter drove down uh, here to, from DC, um, to Western North Carolina, mostly to be with family, since daycares were canceled throughout um, uh, DC. But you know, we saw a lot of uh, people along the along the drive. You know, it's St. Patrick's Day weekend. A lot of people out, um, and so you know, we've been priming this response by several decades of undermining scientific literacy. Um, I, yeah. I think one of the root causes of, of uh, you know, the problem that we're in is that I, I think that um, we d either don't communicate or people don't understand the risk of what an exponential uh, risk really, really looks like, especially with a component that is largely invisible. Right. And so, you know, I, I, I think this is something that we are um you know I, I think we're really looking at something pretty significant historically um and so hopefully we'll learn from this hopefully changes on the other side uh will be made um and you know i really really hope that the folks in the federal government uh, have learned something over the weekend and really get their constituency, their viewership to get inside, right? And, and isolate. Right. I mean, this, it, it's a, uh, it's quite a, uh, it's quite a brutal force that's coming from, uh, from, from cities uh, to some degree. So I, I've, I've been watching um, our, uh, tuning in, I guess our internet connection here is probably not as terrific as uh, uh, as I expected. But I've I've agreed with uh, all of the comments that uh, my friends Jeff and Alice have already um, made. 
the the question about redefining national security, I think, is something that will linger uh, and and needs to be addressed. Uh, in my own world, in the intelligence community, you know, I was often very proud to be one of the only parts of the government that either had the platform or the the freedom to clearly state some of the risks. You know, in the 2019 worldwide threat assessment, it lays out language that's very, very eerily prescient of this moment. Right. But it also landed on page, I think, 21, right? So yes, it's a risk, uh, but we still don't have it calibrated quite right because the, the national security community and this government and other governments is quite substantial, quite large. And they all have their own equities, so. Well, and that, that's, but you raised, you know, that was a, that's a valuable point to raise, which is even, even the smartest among us, um, we know very well that these things are in the mix, that they're, uh, it's like uh, um, uh, Sokolow, uh, let's see, uh, at Princeton, uh, see Rob, Rob Sokolow, he used to call the uh, deep, powerful, dangerous unknowns around climate change, the known risks around climate change, the monsters behind the door. Right. So, and as you, you know, I've written stories that are almost, uh, they're almost in a way insulate, inoculating me saying, I, I, here's what I know about solar flares. Here's what I know about abrupt climate change here. So I, as a journalist, I could say, you know, I've done all that, right? I've wrote 33 years worth of stories on climate change and one, uh, um, but then as you say, it still ends up pulling back. It doesn't lead to a simpler decision space. Right. Because they're all there and we know them, but but we don't invest against the solar flare and we don't, you know, I've also written about earthquake risk. You know, I, one of the blah, 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 bang pieces I wrote was when uh, after Fukushima, after the Japan quake and uh, a reader said, wow, if we can't get this right with tsunamis, even on a coastline where for centuries, <laughs> these stones were saying, you know, don't build below this stone. Right. Uh, how are we going to get climate change right? And uh, it just comes back to this question of, is there some other mechanism that can create, or, or maybe it's, maybe it, we all know that we're not going to get it right. So then it comes down to, well, what are the capacities in society that we know if you tweak them a certain amount can get us through things a little more right than otherwise? And there was a climate, there was a comment posted by Jeremy Zalar again, who said, uh, this is kind of fun. He used to be in the White House, uh, uh, OSTP, I think, um, digital.gov. He said, in your role, roles, we'll say, what is one challenge you need help overcoming this week that will make a 5% impact? In other words, what's something we can do now that can make things less bad that you can think of right now that's like in the mix, knowing we're not going to get them right? when they're on page 21 of the uh, security intelligence report. Are we talking about infectious diseases? Well, let's uh, focus, yeah, we'll focus or, on that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I would, I would just jump in and say, um, I, would, I would ask uh, for entities that have the power to do so to alleviate some of the economic anxiety that a number of Americans and other, your, uh, other citizens worldwide have. Uh, that that puts them into harm's way by getting into the communities, going to work, getting food. You know, there's a real serious economic livelihood issue at stake here that works against social distancing. And it would be great if the federal government came in and said, look, you know, we got your back. We, we are going to uh, delay, you know, uh, tax returns. We're going to put money into your bank accounts. Because it's paramount. Because we've 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 bungled pretty much every other response. It's paramount to get uh, that physical distance between human beings larger. Yeah, it's true. What, what about Jeff and uh, Alice? Uh, some glaring little thing. <laughs> 
Uh, I would add, I think it's the social distancing right now. I, I uh, share Rod's concern. I think there is an economic uh, a question here, and it's going to fall very unfairly on a number of people uh, who do not have uh, the backup. We know that, for example, renters uh, don't have $400 in cash to fall back on. Most Americans don't have $2,000. Most American families don't have $2,000 if they need to evacuate. Those kinds of studies are um, devastating when you look at this economy where people are going to be highly dependent on earning uh, a minimum from a minimum wage job. But we need to get the message out so it's no longer socially acceptable to have people out and about, as Rod described. We need to flip that so that we're looking askance at people who are out and about right now. I think the average American uh, looks at the people who are staying at home and really hunkering down and think they're, I suspect they might think it's kind of funny. I mean, I have friends, my own friends who say, let's meet for lunch. I'm like, right. I'm not meeting for lunch right now in a restaurant. Or uh, another friend, I really want to go to Peru in two weeks. I don't think you're going to Peru in two weeks. So I know that well-informed, seemingly well-informed, smart people, just if they haven't been able to cut through the noise to understand how critical it is that we all try to get someplace where we're not interacting with each other, except for digitally, as you've done so well here. Um, yeah. But we are not physically interacting. And, and that is, I don't think that's widely understood. I, I think people view it as kind of unusual that uh, others are deciding completely to stay away from doing anything except what's absolutely necessary. Yeah. And Jeff, what about universities? Uh, well, we have a, a big role to play. I, I think whether it's university, well, universities and expertise, I think yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's getting better in terms of kind of the, you know, hashtag and Fauci we trust, right? That the, <laughs> the experts are getting to the podium faster and, and you know, or they're on the Sunday talk shows and they're not muzzled. At the same time, back to Alice's early point about the importance of communicators and the, the, the connectors, I... It, I, I would hope that there are significant efforts uh, being made to reach out to key influencers, particularly influencers to audiences that aren't taking this seriously and trying to elicit a wider set of uh, voices to get to break through. And so that is um, in the entertainment industry and in sports and faith and, and religion in business. I think uh, we want to hear from and listen to the medical expertise. Um, and we certainly are seeing uh, on occasion state leaders and local leaders who are taking strong action and, um, and decisive action. I think we need to get over the shock, for example, of the cancellation of the NBA season in part by <laughs> some of those leaders tell that community that this isn't uh, a, a uh, kind of unfair depriving them of this entertainment, this, this is real. And so we need to find some ways to reach these people who, for whom the, the science is just not uh, convincing them that this is serious. Yeah, that, you know, I just, uh, on Friday, I was on the Council of Foreign Relations, I actually held a call with Larry Brilliant and um, a guy from Ending Pandemics and a woman, Tara O'Toole, who's working on uh, the technology side of this. And I brought up this question. We were talking again about the underinvestment in communication. And we th I thought, well, is there a brain trust to pull together that includes, uh, you know, some pretty somnolent organizations, the National Academy's uh, Science and Entertainment Exchange, which mm -hmm. I've, I've liked. I've been part of that before. Mm -hmm. uh, they talk to Hollywood all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and I said, well, you know, can we have Joe, Joe Rogan's podcast with Mike Osterholm? I don't know if you've seen or heard it. It's fantastic. And Joe Rogan has millions of kind of Midwestern male white acolytes. Um, it was all about the importance of these issues. It was very compelling. Um, and just what you said about the NBA, maybe it's, if we got Joe Rogan and the National Academies folks and Mark Ruffalo and others in a room and came out with a game plan, it, uh, maybe that would help. And the I, NBA, I, NBA stars. That's right. Um, so, uh, so I'm glad you brought up that Joe Rogan uh, 
you know, interaction with Mike Osterholm, who, you know, I'm a big fan of, you know, his work on infectious diseases. Uh, I wish that conversation could be duplicated in uh, you know, Howard Stern, um, you know, on Instagram, you know, on TikTok, yeah. anywhere that the, the message hasn't uh, really gotten out. I noticed while you were scrolling through the Twitter yeah. uh, feed, I'm sorry if I'm uh, distracted, you you actually pulled up a Washington Post um, story that I think is maybe one of the best uses of uh, the new types of HTML um, uh, formatting that showed real-time simulations of different parameters. Oh, right that shows how flattening the, the curve works. I'm not certain that that is, has wide audience appeal, <clears throat> but for someone who takes the time to really run those toy simulations and really understand, it allows you to really understand why social distancing is so important and really why it's one of the few uh, uh, things we have in the arsenal at this point. Yeah, I, I, it's um, although it has to be like incorporated into a game that a hundred million people play. Um, right. Well, this is that, just part of a story, but you know those graphs that you're showing. Sure. Uh, are the results of that simulation? They're not some illustrator. Right. 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 No. No. Right? no. right. And so, uh, you know, this is this is a way to uh counteract the you know the scientific illiteracy that i have been bemoaning for most of my professional career right. um but it because it's illustrative and because it's visual i think it it connects with a different section of uh the readership you know unfortunately it's on in the washington post which is dismissed right. by a large number of americans uh you know it'd be great if this were pushed through you know reddit or wherever else uh, unorthodox readers uh, gather. And it would be even better if if the viewer could somehow see their own grandparents and- That's right. Well- and eight faces on those things. One of the big complaints about, that I have of this. So I, when I was a, a physicist, I used to run, I used to write programs like this when I was a, a research physicist and, um, one of the one of the interesting things about it is it doesn't show anyone dying and removing right. themselves from the grid, um, right. which has you know its own its own effects. So we're kind of um, we're over time. I'm sorry, I joined late. No, no, no. Uh, it's great extended. that you can finally get on. No, I, I, we could do this every week, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, you know, and just track this iteratively. I think there's a lot to uh, explore here. Um, and Happily. I think so. I I I, I plan we to need make something this. to do. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and, and, and and you know, on that front too, the uh, there are there is plenty to do. I um, I know. I was talking with Jeff at the beginning. Uh, there are teachers uh, who are self organizing and building uh, curricula around the virus. There there are right. Uh, Jeremy Jeremy Zlar, who I was uh, had on earlier today, um, he's offered his services to um, small businesses and small organizations to help them transition to online uh, it's, it's capacity. Uh, because we need to do that anyway with respect to, uh, you know, rethinking how we we do uh, things, certainly with conferences, right. academic conferences and meetings, we really need to be pursuing this technology anyway. Um, for sure, for sure. And so, but, you know, you bring up, so, my class, my uh, once a week class at Georgetown, you know, at Georgetown, we're, we've converted to online instruction, but, uh, you know, I've been getting emails from students saying, we're expected to come back to campus and move out and maybe put ourselves in harm's way. You know, I, I'm, this is a lot more complicated and there are a lot more ramifications. I'm sure Jeff has, sees this in spades. Um, and maybe at the end of the day, it's, you know, there's a chance that these universities are just going to abandon their semesters. Um, yeah. So, yeah, wow. or, and, 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 and that yeah. this is the, the spur to fundamentally rethinking higher education. Bingo. Already the, the, the only area that's growing in 
in at least U.S. higher education is the online student. That's the, right. The traditional right. student is no longer the 18 to 22, but it's uh, the, the new traditional is, yeah. is something that is not that, that uh, demographic. And I think this is just going to continue to push forward what's already become a trend of putting things online and reaching people. And there are a lot of really positive accessibility sides, but it's going to, I think, fundamentally uh, reshape the prospects for the in-person four-year liberal arts degree in ways right. that I'm only beginning to appreciate. Unfortunately, I have a conference call at uh, 6.15, so I'm going to have to sign No, up. Alice, it's fine. But I want to just you, say- Alice, did you have a final thought? I think that what we've heard here is inspirational. It has reminded me that we all have a unique each of us have a unique position to be bigger voices in this and help others understand. This is a, unlike anything that I know I've lived through, it far surpasses what I believe occurred on 9-11 in terms of a challenge for our nation. So it's all hands on deck. And thank you, Andy, for convening this and drawing so much attention to it. We cannot focus on this too much right now. So right. thank you. Thank you Thanks, all for Mark. being part of it. Thank we'll, you. We'll do it again. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.